I personally suspect Simone de Beauvoir was a little bit racist. Welcome back to another Levity Books review. My name is Liam and I hope you're reading well. Today we're talking about The Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir. It's often hailed as a canonical feminist text, although at the time of writing, Simone de Beauvoir was reluctant to identify as a feminist. This isn't the first time it's happened. Think of Virginia Woolf with A Room of One's Own, or Margaret Atwood in The Handmaid's Tale. Virginia Woolf and Margaret Atwood were hailed as feminist figures before they themselves clearly identified as feminists. So I sometimes wonder whether we are paradoxically oppressing women by identifying them as feminists before they identify themselves. We're placing a definition which doesn't need to be made. The Second Sex is often called a work of political theory, existential philosophy, or a work of feminism, but I feel much safer myself just claiming it as what its writing structure shows that it is. It is a polemic. As a polemic, the second sex conveys two main messages. First, that gender is a social construct, and second, that women have been systematically oppressed by social institutions on the basis of their gender identity. This is a comprehensive history of what is called the patriarchy. The key quote in this massive tome is, one is not born a woman, but rather becomes a woman, which highlights how we in a heterocentric society believe that our sex identifies our gender identity and that history dictates what that gender identity means for roles in society. The second sex was to sexual dynamics what the communist manifesto was to capital, a revolt against social norms which constrained individual freedom. After reading The Second Sex, you will be fundamentally sure exactly how society has oppressed the economic and educational freedom of women. The reason I read The Second Sex as a straight man is because feminism affects everyone whether or not you agree, understand, or know about it, and it's paradoxical to me that I could love a woman or anyone without understanding what really affects them, and this movement really affects people. I was also interested in The Second Sex because of how influential it was to Camille Paglia, who along with Jordan Peterson and Slavoj Zizek are the only cultural critics which are getting through to the youth today. They seem to be the only people asking the right questions. Whether or not they have the right answers is always variable, but it's interesting because Camille Paglia is now seen as an anti-feminist, and to think that she was first inspired by The Second Sex makes me wonder what has gone wrong. <laughs> And I dislike some aspects of feminism and associated ideologies that I intend to minimize and clarify as precisely as I can for my own personal growth. And so while this book is historically important, I think there are many reasons why I would say that this is probably not worth your time. It's massive, outdated, vague, and exclusionary in a way which I think that there are better alternatives. The second sex is to second wave feminism as is what Mary Wollstonecroft's The Vindication of the Rights of Women is to first wave feminism. Both are large, dense, dull, pedagogical texts calling for the emancipation of women. The problem is that what was once called a feminist text in the past is now called an anti-feminist text in the present day. For example, Wollstonecroft wrote that masculine is a redundant word because there's little reason to fear that women will acquire too much courage or fortitude because their visible inferiority in bodily strength must make them to some extent dependent on men in the various relations of life. Needless to say, Wollstonecraft's statement would be contentious and probably labelled as anti-feminist. The second sex similarly seems outdated in that it seems to focus mainly on the interests of middle-class white bourgeois women. Because the second sex largely omits race and sexuality from its discussion, it's got a very heterocentric worldview that's not that applicable today. I personally suspect Simone de Beauvoir was a little bit racist. She keeps lamenting that being a privileged white woman is like being a black man, without ever saying that racism was inherently bad, or that saying that just, just, it's just not a comparison that's needed or necessary. It's as if she's claiming that racism should always be greater than sexism. 
This subtle repeated racist tone just makes me lose a little bit of sympathy for her argument. Much of the arguments of the second sex are based on historical evidence that was maybe not applicable at the time of publication, but has long shifted since its publication. So that is an argument in favor that this book was important and powerful and did bring about changes, but also that it might not be that relevant today. It might only be a historical text that you can look back on. It's not exactly clear what the second sex does beyond the vindication of the rights of women or A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf, but unlike the other books, the second sex is much longer and over a third of this book are direct quotes from other places, and she rarely develops those quotes. The reason this book is popular is because it's a reference text of all the oppression before it, but it adds no original insight and it gives no clear future directions. It opened up the debate but it gave no directions. I found the second sex in no way to be intellectually visionary, there's no interesting theories in here, and it holds value only as a writer's reference text. It doesn't specify that anyone or anything should change specifically and how. It makes no geographical claims, no concrete claims on how society should change. The second sex is a completely impractical book. By contrast, Virginia Woolf's argument in A Room of One's Own was just more balanced, enjoyable, engaging, precise, and just more lyrical and just way, way better. Because arguing that a woman's welfare depends on her ability to be heard, which depends on her ability to have enough money to afford a room in which she can write, is a very concrete argument. It outlines a socio-economical requirement for women to have enough money to live by themselves to then represent themselves so that then we can balance out the things in society. Moreover, this book at worst creates just more hostility than is needed, but in the war of the sexes was really ignited by this book. This book isn't for everyone, nor is it for every woman. In the introduction, Simone de Beauvoir asked not to be seen as a woman, that she doesn't have to be identified as a woman to make her claims, but then she addresses claims as, as if she was a representative of women, and she condemns men. To me, it was both cowardly and hypocritical of Simone de Beauvoir to criticise John Stuart Mill for being a feminist just because he was a man that he belonged to the patriarchy on the basis of his sex, despite the fact that as an ethical philosopher, he founded with Jeremy Benson the principle of utilitarianism, which to date is the most humanitarian ethical rule that we have, so clearly he was on the side of everyone. It's also unclear if Simone de Beauvoir is a separatist feminist, in which case she would contrast with recent feminist movements like he for she, Simone de Beauvoir also casts doubt and guilt on women who want to just be mothers or don't want to be that professionally dedicated, which in itself seems like a strong form of female oppression. And so as a system, the second sex seems to support a minority of well-educated, privileged women at the expense of the majority of less privileged women. But this is unsurprising because most social systems end up doing this. But I find it hard to see how this book can be societally beneficial when it comes at it from this angle. While this book identifies and condemns patriarchy, I don't think it rightfully addresses equality and develops we need to take as a society to better ourselves, because it creates resentment between socio-economic classes and sexual identities. Is it in Simone de Beauvoir's interest to make the world more civil? It's unclear how we should interpret Simone de Beauvoir's thoughts on how women and men should treat each other. Simone de Beauvoir clearly had an unhappy relationship with her husband and her father, so it's hard to take her experiential claims as unbiased. Many feminists have had unhappy relationships with men, so it's hard to know how representative their views are for women on men. Alain Sorel's critique of feminism and Simone de Beauvoir in particular go much further in this regard, but it's a bit off topic, so you can go find that if you want. But in general, all of this hails back to the question whether we should listen to the ideas and philosophies of people who just seem unhappy or not to live the lives that we want to lead. That maybe to be individually happy, we have to listen to people who are individually happy with their life in the respect that we are listening to them too. To be happy, we must listen to the experts. But well, that's for you to decide, I'll let you figure that out for yourself. And this book has helped all of us have the ability to decide what we want to be. And that's why it's such a historically important book. But I would highly recommend you read Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own instead, as it's way shorter 
and it gets way more to the point. That's all. Happy reading.